Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 34. In this lecture, we'll discuss collisions in two dimensions. This topic is covered in Chapter 9 of our textbook by Surway and Gillette. In our previous lecture, we used the principle of momentum conservation to analyze collisions. However, the collision problems that we considered were relatively simple one-dimensional collisions. Specifically, all the examples that we considered in our last lecture were head-on collisions. In a head-on collision, the velocity of each particle is along the line joining the two centers of mass. We'll define the center of mass very precisely in a future lecture, but for now, imagine that each object is a simple sphere. In that case, you can draw a line from the center of one sphere to the center of the other sphere. That's this dashed black line that you see in the figure. Notice how in this example, all of the velocity vectors point along that line. They might be pointing to the right or pointing to the left, but the two velocity vectors are collinear, meaning that they both point along the same line, along the line that joins the two centers of mass. These types of collisions are referred to as head-on collisions. Head-on collisions are relatively simple because they are one-dimensional problems. All of the motion, both before the collision and after the collision, is confined to one axis of motion. You can call this line the x-axis, you can call it the y-axis, but whatever you call it, you're guaranteed that even after the collision, the particles will be moving along that axis. Might be to the left, might be to the right, positive or negative, but all of the velocity vectors, both before and after, are guaranteed to be along that single line of motion. Not all collisions are this simple. So in this lecture, we want to generalize and consider two-dimensional motion. Not all collisions are head-on collisions. Some are glancing collisions. In a glancing collision, the velocity of each particle is not along the line joining the two centers of mass. In this example down here, once again, we have two spheres colliding. We can draw a line connecting the center of one sphere to the other sphere. That's this dashed black line that you see. As you can see now, the velocity vectors are not pointing along that line. This line is sometimes referred to as the line of action. Although the velocity vectors are initially both along the x-axis, they are not along the line of action, and as a result, this collision becomes a little more complicated. After the collision, the particles no longer have to move along the x-axis. They might move at arbitrary angles both in the x and y directions. These collisions are called glancing collisions. They're more complicated because they are essentially two-dimensional problems. The velocity vectors point both in the x and the y direction. The initial velocity vectors might be simple, but the final velocity vectors will be complicated. They will have an x component and a y component. They will have a magnitude and a non-zero angle. Our goal in this lecture is to be able to analyze glancing collisions. In some sense, glancing collisions are really no different than head-on collisions. Once we know that the system of two particles is isolated, we can apply the principle of conservation of momentum. So there's really no new physics here. The difference is in the algebraic complexity of glancing collisions. Problems in which we have a glancing collision essentially are twice as complicated as head-on collisions. If you're solving a head-on collision problem, you simply write the initial momentums in the x direction and the final momentums in the x direction, and that's all you have to worry about. You essentially have one conservation of momentum equation. However, for glancing collisions, you have to consider two equations. This first one tells us that momentum is conserved in the x direction. The second one tells us that momentum is conserved in the y direction. Remember that momentum is a vector quantity. It has separate x and y components, so we need a conservation equation for each one of those um, directions. 
So glancing collisions don't really bring in any new physics. However, dealing with the additional complexity in algebra and the mathematics involved requires some practice. We'll finish this lecture with a rather complicated example of a glancing collision. A particle of mass 3 kilograms collides elastically with an identical particle. The collision is a glancing collision. Particle 1 has an initial speed of 5 meters per second, while particle 2 is initially at rest. After the collision, particle 1 scatters at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to its initial velocity, while particle 2 scatters at an angle phi. Find the final speeds of the two particles and the angle phi. Notice there is a lot going on in this problem. For a complicated problem with so much information, you really ought to read the problem twice or maybe three times, and you should underline key phrases and think about what they mean. For example, we're told that a particle of mass 3 kilograms collides elastically. So the elastic part, this phrase here, gives us an important clue. Specifically, it tells us that k initial is equal to k final. Remember, in elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. We're also told that it collides elastically with an identical particle. If the particles are identical, their masses must be the same. So that tells us that m1 is equal to m2. So both particles have a mass of 3 kilograms. The collision is a glancing collision, so when you see glancing collision, you should be thinking that I need to analyze this problem in two dimensions. So we'll write something like P initial in the X direction is equal to P final in the X direction. That's conservation of momentum in the X direction. But we'll also write P initial in the Y is equal to P final in the Y. So we'll have to consider both dimensions. Particle 1 has an initial speed of 5 meters per second, while particle 2 is initially at rest. So that tells me that um, V2 initial is equal to 0, or a little more precisely, it's 0, comma 0, meaning that it is at rest, its x component and y component of velocity are 0. After the, after the collision, particle 1 scatters at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to its initial velocity. So this angle here is given to us. While particle 2 scatters at angle phi, this angle here is unknown. We'll have to find that. Notice the question is asking for the final speeds of the two particles and the angle phi, which means in total we're interested in three unknown quantities. We need to know what V1F is, we need to know what V2F is, and we need to know what phi is. So you should be thinking that if you want to solve for three unknowns, you will need three equations. More precisely, we'll have a system of equations involving three unknowns, which we will then have to solve. It helps at this point if you write down the velocities in terms of their components. For example, it's helpful to write V1 initial as 5 comma 0 because you're told it's traveling with a speed of 5 and we're going to assume that's in the x direction. The final velocities will not necessarily be in the x direction, but the initial velocities can be written in the x direction. Of course, V2 initial is easy, it's at rest, so its components are 0 and 0. Now, V1 final is going to be a little more complicated. We don't really know what the magnitude or the speed of this vector is, but whatever it is, if we just simply write it as V1F without an arrow, we can say its x component is going to be cosine of theta, and its y component is going to be V1F sine of theta. We know what theta is, that's 30 degrees, so we can plug that in. We can do a similar thing for particle 2, as you can see here. However, for particle 2, we don't know what phi is, and we don't know what V2F is. Our goal will be to solve for those. So this is a rather complicated problem. It's probably the most complicated collision problem you're, you're going to encounter in this class.
So before I give you a detailed solution, let me first give you an outline of what the solution is going to look like. Remember that we are interested in three unknowns in this particular problem. Our three unknowns, the quantities that we want to solve for, are the speed of particle one after collision, the speed of particle two after the collision, and the angle or orientation of the velocity of particle two, that's this angle here. If we're interested in solving for three unknowns or three variables, we need three equations. Our three equations will be the following. Basically, we'll write down conservation of momentum in the x direction. That'll be one equation. Our second equation will be conservation of momentum in the y direction. And because the collision is said to be elastic, we know kinetic energy is conserved. So our third equation will be the conservation of kinetic energy equation. Writing down each one of these equations is going to take some time and a fair amount of practice, so try doing this on your own. Once you have these three equations down, you'll have to combine them, and as you look at the equations, you might notice that you'll be able to add some of the equations together. When you add these equations together, you may want to use a famous equation from your trigonometry days namely that cosine of phi squared plus sine of phi squared is equal to 1. This identity from trigonometry is true for any angle phi, and of course it's going to be true for the angle phi in this particular problem. You'll use this trigonometric identity to combine equations 1 and 2, and once you have done that, you can begin to solve for your three unknowns. You will find that V1F is approximately equal to 4.33, V2F is approximately equal to 2.5 meters per second, and you'll be able to solve for phi, the angle, and that will be 60 degrees. So I gave you an outline for solving this problem, and hopefully you tried your own hand at it. Here is the detailed solution. As I said, we need three equations. Conservation of x momentum is this equation here. Notice the initial momentum of each particle is calculated, 3 times 5 for particle 1 and 3 times 0 for particle 2. And on the right, I have the final momentum of the system. So I have 3, which is the mass, times the x component of velocity for particle 1, which is v1f times cosine of 30, and for particle 2 will be v2f cosine of phi. Notice the two particles have the same masses, so you see 3 showing up everywhere for mass. This equation simplifies to this equation here, which I'm calling equation 1. We'll come back to this equation in just a second. We'll want to write another equation for conservation of momentum. The two particles initially are not moving in the y direction, so the y velocities will be zero, which means the initial y momentum of the system is zero. Here's the final y momentum of the system. Notice I'm using the sine function instead of cosine function because I'm talking about the y components. Also notice that there's a minus sign here because while the first particle is moving in the positive y direction, the second particle is going to be moving in the negative y direction. So while one of the particles scatters upwards, the other one will scatter downwards after the collision. This minus sign indicates that the y velocity for particle 2 is in the negative y direction. I'm going to simplify this equation and call it equation 2. Our third equation is conservation of kinetic energy, one-half mv squared for each particle, both before and after the collision. Plugging those numbers in, I get equation 3. I have three equations now for three unknowns, and notice the three unknowns are v1f, v2f, and phi. Those three unknowns show up in this second equation as well. I'm going to solve equation 1 for cosine of phi, and then I'm going to solve equation 2 for sine of phi. That's what I've done here. Cosine of phi is going to be equal to this expression, and sine of phi is going to be equal to this expression. I'm calling these equations 4 and 5. 
I now remember my trigonometric identity, cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. So I'm going to square equation 4, I'm going to square all of equation 5, and I'm going to add those together. When I add those together, I better get 1 because cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. If you look at this expression here, you see that we now have an equation that does not have a phi. So we have effectively eliminated phi, and now we're left with only two unknowns, v1f and v2f. I'm going to solve for v2f, and I'm going to get this equation here, which I call uh, equation 6. Notice we haven't yet used equation 3, that was our kinetic energy equation. I'm now going to combine equation 3 with equation 6. More precisely, I'm going to solve for V2F and plug it into equation 6. And now I have an equation that involves only V1F. I'll have to do some bit of algebra to simplify this equation, but when I simplify it, I can finally solve for V1F and I find that V1F is 4.33 meters per second. I'm going to now combine this fact with equation 6. Remember, equation 6 gives us an expression for V2F. So now we can solve for V2F. Use your calculator for this, obviously, and you will find that V2F is going to be 2.5 meters per second. Once we know V1F and V2F, we can now proceed to solve for phi. So by combining equation 5, this one, which involves phi, and also 7 and 8, which involve V1F and V2F, I find that phi must be equal to 60 degrees. As you can see, there's a fair amount of algebra in this problem. There's no calculus here, so in that sense it's simple, but the algebra is quite intricate and complicated and twisted, so think about this problem for some time until it makes sense. This is really the most complicated example of the glancing collision problem you would get in this, in this class. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.